Okay, let's let's go ahead and get started. Nice to see quite a few folks in uh, the Scott Ring Room. We welcome all of you tuning in virtually and also at the North Hudson campus. Uh, greetings students, colleagues, and friends. Happy spring and welcome to our March Town Hall meeting. We welcome everyone and uh, look forward to another really nice meeting and discussion. But before we begin, I ask you to please join me in a moment of silence for the brave Ukrainian people in this time of extreme challenge for Ukraine and the world community. Thank you. I'd like to begin by actually asking our colleague, Matt Labreak. I'm sorry, Matt, I'm putting you on the spot. Uh, if, if you wouldn't mind introducing our new colleague. We have a new colleague here that we want to introduce. Cecily, welcome. We're delighted to have you here. Do we have any other new colleagues joining us today? Okay. Fantastic. Welcome to the HCCC family. At last week's meeting of the Board of Trustees, three of our valued faculty co colleagues were granted tenure. We congratulate Instructor of Academic Foundations Math, Bernard Adamaiti, uh, Instructor of Physics, Mohammed Qasim, and Instructor of Speech, Jilda Reyes. These colleagues will be promoted to assistant professor next fall. Congratulations, Bernard, Mohammed, and Jola. We're very, very happy for you and for us. We're thrilled that HCCC alumnus Pedro Moranchel has agreed to speak at this year's May commencement exercises to be held at Red Bull Arena in Harrison on Thursday, May 26th, beginning at noon. As many of you are aware, Pedro is finishing his first year at Princeton, which is his junior year. Uh, he's one of only a few community college students nationwide to have been admitted to Princeton last year. And of course, he was a star at HCCC. He was one of two of our students to have been awarded a Jack Kent Cook undergraduate transfer scholarship last year that is paying his full ride at Princeton. Uh, and so we're gonna be delighted to welcome him back. And preparing for commencement in this large and new venue is a huge undertaking. I want to take this opportunity to thank Lisa Doherty, Nicholas Chevrolati, Veronica Gerasimo, David Clark, Julio Maldonado, and many others for their leadership and support in all areas of planning and delivering this year's commencement ceremony. And let me say, I know uh, I've heard several folks say they're surprised the ceremony is being held so late, May 26th. The reality is it's it's the earliest doable date that we could use the facility, Red Bull Arena. So that's the reason it's a little bit later, but we are nonetheless really excited about this new venue. We're planning a colorful and inclusive processional and recessional of faculty, staff, and graduates around the stadium. So remember, this is a totally new ball game. Uh, no pun intended. <laughs> uh, big, big, expansive stadium, plenty of seats. So we're going to have uh, a processional and a recessional that really is traditional in the spirit of commencements. Uh, again, unlimited seating. I think they have 20,000 or more seats. I think that'll be enough. So our graduates can bring as many family members and guests as they wish. And there will also be free parking in the Harrison parking garage, which is located in easy walking distance of the stadium. I'm told there's plenty of parking there. <laughs> Uh, we will have shuttles for those that need them, even though it's not a far walk. And uh, it's also possible to park in the gravel lot on a per pay basis if you want to be closer. But free parking in the garage, free parking for everyone. As a result of these changes and the new venue, we hope to have a record attendance this year of faculty and staff to celebrate our students' achievements since the beginning of the pandemic. We encourage our faculty and staff to process an academic regalia. Uh, regalia can be ordered through our bookstore and details will be forwarded to the college community shortly. And also really, really importantly, after the ceremony, and we will be recess recessing out to music, uh, again, unlike was the case at NJ Pack, just for space uh, reasons, we're gonna be having a special reception in the stadium with a nice opportunity for very nice refreshments, music, but plenty of space to interact with students and their families. 
immediately following the ceremony. So at the reception, there will also be space for pictures. So we hope uh, this year to have an opportunity for more personal interaction of faculty and staff with our guests and their families following the ceremony. Due to the vast size of Red Bull Arena, we'll need many volunteers and staff to participate in the event, regardless of whether they plan to process in regalia. So we want lots of folks processing, but we also need other folks helping with the other parts of the ceremony. Uh, both of our campuses will be closed that day, and all classes will be uh, canceled that day to allow for this. And again, more information will be forthcoming. But in the meantime, feel free to visit the graduation page on the college's website, as updates will continue to be posted there. And the website's also the most helpful resource for graduating students who have questions about commencement. Commencement, of course, is <clears throat> a celebration of student success, the ultimate celebration. So in that vein, it's now my pleasure to introduce HCCC's Student Success Dream Team co-chairs, Dr. Heather DeVries and Dr. Sheila Dynan, to offer an update on the continuing comprehensive work of the Student Success Dream Team. Heather. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Sheila, are you with us? I am. OK, Sheila's going to start off our update today. All right. Um... Our specific uh, dream team update is that uh, Mary Fifield and Renee Garcia are two wonderful coaches who will be visiting us virtually in April, and that will be April 19th to the 22nd. And uh, we are working on the calendar and their and the uh, process of their uh, their visit with us. So. More details will come as soon as we can solidify some of the, the, the pieces that need to be. The bigger piece that we always have to take into consideration is that um, Dr. Mary Fifield is in the central time zone. So we have to kind of accommodate those pieces of it. The other piece that really is, is falling in under this is the Jed Foundation piece that is helping us to help students. And tomorrow and Thursday, the Jed Foundation Committee will be on campus um, specifically tomorrow to do, <clears throat> to do the touring components of the program. So they will be in the uh, North Hudson campus and they will be on the uh, General Square campus. In the late afternoon, they have requested a student um, panel with the JED uh, representatives, and um, they, that will take place in the student center, and uh, food will be provided for our students, and transportation will be um, set up for the students who are coming from North Hudson and, and taking them back. On Thursday, the entire day will be a remote component and the first section of the day will be working with the mental health counseling component and the care team people to really solidify some more information and then starting at 8 11 30 through five o'clock the entire jed team will be working with the um, new york representatives to create a strategic plan for student um, suicide prevention and alcohol and drug uh, abuses. And that will be dovetailed into our own Hudson's uh, strategic plan. And they were very happy to see what was in our new plan that had a, a lot of mental health components to it. And they will. Of the Hudson Helps Initiative. Uh, Dr. Sorhan Abdullah and Dr. Gretchen Schultes for the early warning, early alert um, working group that is also dovetailing with some of our campus works um, initiatives and selecting selecting additional software to serve those needs. Dr. Pamela Bandiapadier and Joseph Caniglia for their work on Student Success Academy, Jacqueline Safant and Matthew Labreak for Accessibility Services, and Dr. Lori Bird, Lisa Chekowitz, and Catherine Sarangelo for leading the pre-nursing initiative. Um, and of course, we also thank John Scanlon and John Argola for, for their tireless efforts in democratizing data and providing us all of those important data points we need to move our student success work forward. 
Otherwise, we did want to provide a brief data update at our last dream team meeting last week. Um, John Scanlon shared um, some data visualizations with us that are currently in beta testing and we hope to to be able to share out more more broadly soon. Um, but again, joining ATD was really about adopting a laser like focus on student success and, you know, a data rich culture, making data informed decisions. And part of that is establishing our own data informed goals for our student success work. And Mary and Renee spend a lot of time talking with us with us about leading and lagging indicators that our lagging indicator as an institution was really moving the needle on our completion rate um, for all students, but also for that that first time full time cohort. Um, so we are pleased to to report that it is from when Sheila and I reported to the board in August, last August, where we saw a 25% improvement in our three year completion rate, where it had improved from 12% when measured in summer 17 to 15% when measured in summer 21. We're now seeing it inch even half a percentage point higher and we're hoping that trend will continue as the academic year goes on for when we measure again this summer. So more needs to be there, but definitely moving in the right direction. And that is not an easy number to move. So Otherwise, in terms of leading indicators, again, we measure graduation as our or completion as our lagging indicator, but by the time we get that number, it's too late to change it. To really move the needle on that number, we need to pay attention to leading indicators, like fall to spring retention and fall to fall retention. Um, and we have some good news as well with those numbers when measured for both our first time full time and first time part time, as well as transfer in first time and uh, transfer in full time and transfer in part time. So we're really looking at the whole student body. Um, and we really see across across those um, groups, we really see a, a continuing positive trend with both fall to fall retention and fall to spring retention. Um, again, there is a little bit of noise um, in certain groups, in particular for for transfer full time um, for the fall to fall retention rate, and then we see full time um, or first time part time again a little bit of, of noise that we have to continue to sort through and drill down but you know interestingly these trends these positive trends in terms of retention are holding not only for the different groups across first time status versus transfer in status full time versus part time but we're also seeing when we disaggregate that's the other key component of our data work with ATD about not kind of taking numbers at face value um, while well, that's an important kind of 30,000 level view but drilling down and separating out by, by gender by age group, Pell status, and race ethnicity to see what's going on at a more granular level and where there are equity gaps that need to be addressed. Um, and again, we have to sort through some, some of the more granular findings, but I think one promising trend that stood out to me when looking at the fall to fall and fall to spring retention rate is that we saw some really nice gains in students over the age of 25. Um, which was, I think, is really promising. That is not a specific focus of our ATD work, but has been a larger college-wide initiative to really support these, these students, um, especially through the pandemic. Um, and as we move out of the pandemic into the new normal, uh, Dr. Karen Stout mentioned this age group um, in her remarks at the DREAM 2022 conference. So that was a really promising trend that really stood out um, in other places where we need to do a little bit more digging. So again, these numbers are not easy to move. It's really taken the work of the entire college community. And we are so grateful for, for, your, for everyone's continued involvement and passion for our students and their success. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. That is just phenomenal. Phenomenal. We're seeing the needle truly move, really uh, now very broadly across the college, uh, very much correlated with the work we're doing in student success, which is as mission critical as you can get, right? So this is something we can all be enormously proud of. Uh, Heather and Sheila, thank you so much. Just for so you all know, we lost everybody uh, that was uh, joining virtually for a, a few minutes. So Sheila, it wasn't just you. And we apologize to everyone else, but I think we have everyone back now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to also note that, uh, did we have a hand raised? I did want to ask, I, I saw a hand raised. Is there anyone that wants to ask a question or make a comment? No, okay. I also want to, uh, to note, uh, related to uh, this positive movement in retention and completion, is the continuing, really compelling success of our Hudson Scholars project. This is the project to scale the successful elements of our EOF program to 
uh, to about 800 additional students with the the hope that eventually we can scale it to all students. And uh, we're continuing to see sustained significant differences between the numbers of students in Hudson Scholars, just like we see in you know, the students in EOF, outperforming their other peers who are not in these programs. I mean, by double digits, by like 20% or more. Very, very significant and encouraging. I'm also delighted, if you have not heard this yet, to announce that the North Hudson Campus ent entrance, atrium, <laughs> entrance Atrium will be named in honor of United States Congressman Albio Series. Congressman Series has been a strong partner and valued supporter of the college and is held in high esteem and affection by the trustees, all of, uh, all of the faculty and staff, our students, and the community he served with distinction for so many years. Congressman Series has announced his planned retirement from public service at the conclusion of his current term in office as our United States Congressman. Congressman Series will be honored during the North Hudson Campus 10th anniversary celebration on Monday, April 25th. And this is really an exciting moment for the college. That is the 10th anniversary. And speaking of the North Hudson Campus, we were so pleased to learn that Hudson County Community College is the recipient of a $980,000 federal earmark grant to equip and staff seven classrooms on our North Hudson campus with immersive telepresence video or ITV synchronous classroom technology systems that I think all of you are familiar with and many of you are using. This federal earmark grant will help us expand our use of the state of the art technology across our campuses and facilities. Uh, we were one of about, um, well, I think there were $95 million in earmarks nationally. Uh, we, we received a million of that, and um, we're really delighted. So we, of course, thank again Congressman Series. And by the way, we decided to name the Adrian for him before we got this announcement. Uh, but he played a central role. And also Senators Robert Menendez and Cory Booker, they all supported our earmark re request. I also want to thank Vice President Nicholas Chevrolati for his leadership of our earmark grant submission, and CIO Patricia Clay and her team for planning, helping us plan this multifaceted project, which is, of course, part of our total ongoing investment in state-of-the-art technology. So with that, I'd like to invite North Hudson Campus Executive Director Joe Coniglia to offer a North Hudson Campus update. Joe. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm so excited about this grant. It's going to give us the opportunity to offer a lot more courses for our students at the North Hudson campus. So we're very excited about that. As Chris mentioned, our 10th year anniversary celebration at the North Hudson campus is approaching soon. You should all be receiving information this week, more information regarding that. Um, I'm happy to announce too that several North Hudson students and Jersey City students will be accompanying me April 10th through the 15th be, they will be attending the New York Model United Nations Conference. So I'm very excited. They have been working very hard. They will participate with about two to 3,000 students from all over the world. So I'm real excited about that. I'd like to give a special shout out to the students. Raina El Shibani, Rena El Shibani, same last name, Jenny Martinez, Daniel Lopez, Jeff Aruna, Ahilia Muna, and Zanab Bori. So congratulations to them. I'm looking forward to attending the conference with all of you. And one last thing. Um, a few months ago, Dr. Pam, uh, Pamela Bandiopathy and I attended the ACTE conference, the Association for Career and Technical Education conference in New Orleans. And we were able to listen to the speaker, Dr. Roger Cleveland, who gave an outstanding presentation on creating culturally inclusive classrooms. So when Pam and I came home, we were discussing, wouldn't it be great if we can have him come to Hudson? So Pam and I have been in touch with Dr. Roger Cleveland, who is a professor at Eastern Kentucky University, and he's the co-founder, oh, well, the founder of and president of Millennium Learning Concepts. Um, we were able to have Dr. Cleveland come by working with Nadia James and Sean Couric because these are for career technical uh, students, but the 
presentations will be open to the entire college. He will be giving virtual presentations on April 29th. From 11 to 1, it will be for students. And the title of his presentation for students will be Implementing Culturally Responsive Strategies for Diverse Learners. And then for faculty, staff, and administrators from 2 to 4, on creating culturally inclusive classrooms. So we are very excited. Uh, more information will be coming out shortly regarding his presentation. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, Joe. Last Friday, as most of us are aware, our college community participated in Professional Development Day 2022. The theme was continuous improvement through higher education. And we thank the many faculty and staff throughout the college who offered workshops for their colleagues on a wide range of professional development topics. We thank Vice President for Human Resources, Anna Kropitsky, Director of Faculty, I'll do them all and then we can clap. Director of Faculty and Staff Development, Lalisa Williams, Center for Teaching, Learning and Innovation Director, Dr. Paula Roberson, Educational Opportunity Fund Director, Jose Lowe, North Hudson Campus Assistant Director, Diana Galvez, among many others on the planning committee and beyond for their leadership of Professional Development Day. How about a round of applause for all of them? Thank you. <laughs> Last evening, I was asked to speak at the quarterly meeting of the New Jersey Council of County Colleges. It was the first meeting of the council on ground since the beginning of the pandemic and was held at Union County College. And I'll tell you, the room was completely full, standing room only. I think everyone was really so happy to get back and be able to see one another. I was pleased and honored to have uh, been asked to share an update of the best practice work at HCCC with respect to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I received many affirming comments and acknowledgments for the work we're doing together. I want to thank Eurus Pujols for helping me prepare the slide presentation. Yes, thank you, Eurus. There continues to be so much happening here in the area of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I'd now like to invite Vice President Pujols, along with President's Advisory Council for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion co-chairs, Lalisa Williams and Jose Lowe, to offer an update. Okay, just making sure that there are only three of us. Um, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Chris, for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, first, I'll give a quick overview of some of the work that, that we're doing, some of our collaborations, and then I'll pass it on to Lilisa and then Jose so they could give specific updates about the goals and how the subcommittees are really taking the lead in many of the, uh, the initiatives that, that we're doing. First, I would like to talk about community engagement. Uh, on the um, Sunday, March 13th, uh, the Colombian uh, government, they held congressional elections at a North Houghton campus, 850 uh, Colombian nationals attended. And it was, you know, it was excellent to be able to provide that type of community access to our, to our partners in that community. Uh, the, uh, they're gonna have a second round, not for congressional elections, but for presidential elections on May 29th. And of course, the expectation is that the number there is going to be, uh, is going to be uh, greater. Uh, uh, along the same lines, uh, Roberto Furcar, he's the uh, Minister of Education for the Dominican Republic. Uh, he's planning to come to Houghton County to, to speak. We're still kind of ironing, in, uh, ironing out the, the details for that. We were looking at April 5th. Unfortunately, the schedules just didn't align. But, you know, that's also an area of opportunity for us to provide an outlet uh, to, 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 our, um, to our constituents. Uh, Dr. William Harvey, I feel that we've been speaking about him for a while already. He's uh, one of the dynamic speakers that we uh, had the opportunity to, uh, to, to hear at the ACCT conference. So we have secured him for uh, April the 19th, and he's a you know, renowned scholar. He uh, speaks about social justice, has a lot of experience about inclusive uh, academia engagements. Um, so you know, we're really happy to, um, to, to, um, to host him. He's the president of a university in Romania. So the last phone call that we had is like, you know, like how does it feel? You're like in the center of the world right now, you know? So that, that would be a really uh, interesting perspective to, to bring here to the college. As you know, the eCornell program is ongoing. Uh, it's, uh, cohort one is full, cohort, cohort two is full. 
summer cohort is almost full. I think we have like one or two seats available and we're in the process of adding additional ones. Keep in mind that this is going to be ongoing for the next uh, couple of semesters, certainly for the fall and the spring. So we'd like to encourage all of you to participate. We're going to be using this to make sure that we're able to embed, you know, DEI work into everything, everything that, that we do. And also um, Dr. Robertson uh, from the, uh, Center for Teaching, Learning, and Innovation, and I and others from PAC, that we're working uh, on a National Day of Prayer. Uh, May 5th is uh, recognized uh, or observed as the National Day of Prayer. So we're hoping to provide a space to many of the individuals within the community and our students to be able to, to participate, you know, to be in the same room with people of like faiths, to communicate, to engage, to network, and also to, to pray together. So if you uh, wanted to participate in this, if you have any more questions, feel free to reach out to Dr. Robertson or I, and you know, we'll be happy to, to take you on that. And I, I know that Lilisa and Jose will talk about the goals and uh, about some of the, the plans that, that, that we have, the programs that are coming down the pipes. But very briefly, I wanted to uh, mention about the women's rights. This is uh, a panel that is hosted by our, our students. The PAC Day Student Action Group led by Dr. Angela Pack. This is the first program. It's going to take place on Thursday, March 24th at 5 p.m. through WebEx. So, you know, if you're able, please attend. We want to support our students. And, you know, they're um, also the Sisterhood of La Humanidad is another group uh, specific to, uh, to create uh, engagement opportunities for, for um, women um, you know, within our community, safe space where women and those who identify as women are encouraged to share, reflect, educate, and start to heal through their experiences. You know, I want to uh, thank uh, Diana Galvez and Diliana Costa for, for doing this, uh, you know, for putting this together. And again, not just them, there's so many others that participated in this. Also want to recognize very briefly the uh, Department of Cultural Affairs, you know, artist receptions and live music that's going to be taking place on March uh, 23rd, starting at 3 p.m. And as we get back to campus, there's going to be so much more happening in that, uh, that sixth floor there. Uh, Women's History Month, uh, Broadway Stories, uh, Scarlett Strelin, she's going to, be, uh, is going to be hosted by Catherine Walker, again, March uh, 25th at 1 p.m. And the other programs I'm sure that Jose and Elisa will speak to, um, as I mentioned at the last, I think it was the ACC meeting, I get the opportunity to go out to places and speak about the incredible work that is happening here. But this is not my work. This is all your work. Like you're doing it. And I just go to tell people how great of a job you're doing. Uh, and, and, and I had the opportunity to present on February 17th at the uh, Dreams Conference, right? We had a half, uh, half an hour presentation. We had a lot of positive feedback. Again, not about us, but the work that all of you are, are doing. And out of that, uh, Achieving the Dream is also hosting at uh, um, Equity Institute. It's going to be taking place March 31st to April 1st. And we were also asked to, to present, to elaborate on some of the themes that we're presenting. So one of the presentations will be in, in community engagement. And the other one was, is going to address specifically our engagement with the, uh, with the Latino community. But, but again, uh, thank you all for all that you do, you know, and it gives all of us a lot of uh, things to say about, uh, you know, the great work that you're doing. Thank you, and I would like to pass it on to Lilisa and Jose. Thank you, Dr. Reber, for this opportunity to share with all of you here. Also, thank you, yours, for mentioning us. But as a co-chair for PAC Day, myself and Jose Lowe, which will be sharing a few things, I just want to share a couple of things that a uh, goal one and goal two of what they're working on. So our subcommittee chairpersons for goal one, that is Michelle Vitale and Veronica Gerasimo. And for our subcommittee uh, co-chairs for goal two, that is uh, Mirita Sanchez and Chris Conzen. I also just want to acknowledge uh, Amala Ogbarn for the couple of years that she was also the subcommittee chair. Because a lot of the work that happens with those groups, with those subcommittees, happens in their committee as they're working on the objectives of that strategic plan. But I want to remind everyone of, and, and first of all, thank all of the uh, subcommittee members for all that you do and uh, showing up to the meetings and coming with your ideas. Uh, some of the ideas coming out of uh, sub goal one, sub uh, committee goal one, is that they are working on a retreat for all the PAC Day members. It's about 50 of PAC, it's about 50 PAC Day members, and that includes uh, students, 
faculty, staff, administrators, and trustee members, and community members as well. We have several community members. We also, and so they're putting together a retreat. They're also planning a big volunteer day, like a recognition, to recognize many people who volunteer with uh, PAC Day. And also, uh, we have our monthly meetings, and we meet once a month. Our next meeting is coming up April the 21st. So if anyone, you know, if you would like to just ever stop by to see, you know, what we talk about, how we conduct our meetings, uh, please let myself or Jose Lowe know, and we'll be glad to send you an invite. And I do have to just give a shout out to Ms. Candace Peterson for uh, updating everyone in the meetings, and it, it's a lot. Uh, she put together a nice uh, pack day members contact list so I could stop copying and pasting uh, 40 emails. So I really appreciate her for that. But those are the kind of things our members do, just sometimes just everyday things. Uh, also, we want to let you know that um, goal one and two, in conjunction with the whole pack day group, came up with this member wall. It's in the, it's in the L building on the sixth floor. And it's a wall with all the names of all the members. So if you haven't had time to go by there, please stop by and, and check it out. Maybe your name is there. Take a picture, share it on social media, and, you know, remind everyone that this is a great place to work. Why? Because we do celebrate the diversity of all of our faculty, staff, and, of course, our students. Also, we want to remind you of story, our stories untold, which is continuing. And this time, I'm very excited. I'm excited about all of the people that present, but this one is special. This storyteller is Julio Maldonado. Yes, he was my student when I was teaching a business class here. I was so honored that he was my student. And so I'm so excited that he is going to be sharing his story. So make sure on March 23rd, it's a Wednesday, please mark your calendar 11 a.m. via WebEx. We got to really support Julio. You wouldn't have those chairs to sit in if, if Julio and his team had not come in the room and prepared them and keep them nice for us. So anyway, I'm so, so excited about that. Uh, also, and, and to the coordinators of that, um, Human Resources, um, Anna Kropitsky, and the Office of DEI uh, VP um, Yuris Pujols. Uh, I'm almost done. I just have one, one more update, I think. Yes. And that is, I just want to give a special recognition uh, for one of our colleagues and a member of PAC Day and also a subcommittee chair, but I'll, I'll let Jose mention that. But uh, Dr. Paula Roberson for her leadership with the uh, Teaching and Learning Symposium on Social Justice. Yes, you can. Um, there were 26 presenters, 26 presenters from all around the country, for sure. Several individuals right here in the college. Uh, I had my first opportunity to ever in my life present on social justice. I'm just honored that I was able to do that and that my supervisor, Anna Kropisky, supported me in that work. I'm so thankful. But it was an amazing event. Over 497 people participated in the in the week. It was a week long or something like that. Yep, a few days, four days, four days. Very powerful. 497 people participated in this event that Dr. Paula Roberson led. So keep up the great work. And if you have any questions about that, please see Dr. Roberson. I'll now turn it on to my co other co-chair, Jose Lowe. You know, um, this is so great coming up here and not having a mask on. I was getting tired of hiding this, you know, handsome mug of mine. <laughs> so um, this is great. And I'm able to see all your faces. So it's also great. On, um, on Thursday, March 17, PAC Day, the UF program and STEM division, sponsor a presentation on women in STEM uh, by Dr. Reen Majetko. Uh, Dr. Majetko is a genetic researcher and a professor with more than 50 years of experience and was part of the scientific team behind the Human Genome Project. Dr. Majeko spoke about her struggles being one of the few women working on the Human uh, Genome Project. She also spoke about other women in science like Rosalind Franklin and her discovery of the DNA structure and how she did not get the, the credit she had this, that she deserved in the 1950s. 
Dr. Majeko spoke to a room of 40 students, staff, and faculty members. It was not hard to notice that the students enjoy every minute of Dr. Majesco's presentation. The presentation, the presentation started at 3.30 in the afternoon and the students were still asking questions about the subject well into the five o'clock hour. The students also held signs of appreciation and support like it was, like it was a rock concert. And it was actually a science rock concert. I took a minute to, to survey the room to see if their students were distracted. And I noticed that no one was looking at their phones. In fact, our students were using their phones to take pictures of the presentation. As an educator who is always trying to find ways to keep the interest level of my students, seeing the level of engagement of the students who were present was one of the most touching exhibitions of the education experience that I have not seen in quite a while. I want to thank, thank uh, Dr. Irene Majetko, Dr. Burrow Yearwood, uh, Rafi Majikian, Ms. Tejo Perek, and the students and staff and faculty who were present for this successful event. We, were, we had a great, great event that day. On um, all the news, uh, PAC Day Goal 3, uh, the, the goal that ensures that all community college members feel safe and secure while they're on the college campus, uh, composed of Ms. Tejo Perek, uh, Sylvia Mendoza, Warren Rigby, and Cesar Castillo are putting together a, a campus safety training, which will be held um, in both the Union City campus and the Jonas Square campus uh, on different dates, and those dates will be told to you uh, momentarily. Uh, mem uh, members of PAC Day, Subcommittee 3, will be working on, uh, with John Scanlon and on a campus safety survey to obtain data and to ensure we are meeting DEI guidelines. Uh, PAC Day uh, Goal 4, uh, Building Community and Sense of Belonging, uh, composed of Karen uh, Gali, uh, Rafi Manjikian, Elena Winslow, and Tony Acevedo. Uh, Tony is right now putting together a DI climate survey to def so faculty members can define diversity, equity, and inclusion in the classroom. Uh, Paula Robertson and Jackie Stefan will be hosting a workshop on how to have an accessible classroom and the dates and time for that uh, workshop will be also be to be announced. Mental health awareness uh, and wellness is also an, an, an item that the group is working. Elena Winslow and Deliana Costa are working together uh, to promote, uh, to create another workshop on how to create a pro and promote stigma free and safe space classroom. And um, that would be my remarks on the two groups. One, one of the last items I want to mention is the Armenian Genocide and Holocaust Remembrance uh, that is scheduled to be on uh, virtually on WebEx on Thursday, April 28th between 10 and 12 p.m. Also, please pay attention to the emails that will be sent out for that particular uh, workshop. Once again, thank you very much and have a great day. <laughs> Thank you so much, colleagues. Fantastic work. So later today, and when I say later, at 2 o'clock, we're going to need to be finished by 1.30, hopefully before. Uh, the Hudson County Community College Board of School Estimate will hold their annual meeting where I will present our FY23 budget request to the county. We're requesting this year an increase in operating funding of $969,000. That represents a 5.1% increase over this year's county allocation. In, addi in, in addition to our request for Chapter 12 funding for slightly more than $4 million in capital bond financing to be funded equally by the county and the state. Our county leaders are supportive of our, of our asks and our rationale for the requested increase. And the rationale is this, it's to make possible a third consecutive year of level tuition and fees, that means zero increase, while also funding lost revenue associated with the elimination of the student application fee that was approved at the February meeting of the Board of Trustees. Uh, I thank Vice Presidents Veronica Zeitner and Nicholas Chevrolati for their leadership. Keep your fingers crossed, please. Uh, two weeks ago, I had a delightful meeting in my office with staff from the Center Pompidou in Paris. I met with curator Charles Aubon, Anna, I, I, I never took French, I don't know if I got that right. Uh, Anna Hiddleston, who works with the Pompidou Collections, and Chloe Saganos, whose responsibilities are in the performing arts. 
The visitors were extremely interested in learning about our college, our mission, and of course our work with the Foundation Art Collection, the, D the Deneen Hall Gallery, and our performing arts and cultural affairs programs. The Pompidou staff are enthusiastic about partnering with HCCC and particularly enthusiastic about engaging students and faculty in the work of the, of the museum and its programs while also supporting our outstanding programs. And they were really interested in how students might have employment opportunities at the museum and in, in uh, the work of the museum, which is much broader than just the collection. Uh, they're going to be promoting activities and cultural uh, arts in keeping with the, the vision of the transformation of Journal Square uh, to become a cultural arts destination. Uh, in this meeting, I discussed our Hudson is Home 2021-24 college strategic plan and gave them each a copy. And our Center Pompidou colleagues would like us to meet regularly when they're in Jersey City and expressed a desire for a close, mutually beneficial working relationship as planning for the museum's opening in 2024 moves forward. This is going to be a huge addition to uh, right in the middle of our campus, really. Uh, so uh, I know a number of our colleagues have been working uh, in advance of my meeting, um, professors type and I believe uh, Michelle Vitale, um, Andrea Siegel, Nicholas Chevrolet, I'm sure others. So um, stay tuned. This is going to be a great future partnership. We continue to make progress in serving and educating inmates in the Hudson Correctional Facility and reentry citizens through the governor's reentry training an employment center in Kearney. We thank Lori Margolin, Dr. Heather DeVries, and their colleagues for leading this work. Lori and Heather, would you like to offer an update? Hi, good afternoon, everybody. So I'll start with an update on the academic and workforce pathway program for students who are incarcerated at the Hudson County Correctional Facility. Uh, for the spring semester, we have a total of 19 students, 10 in workforce, 9 in the degree program. Spring semester classes include academic foundations and CSS 100 for the new students. Uh, the workforce students are taking a computer basics class and a life skills class with our partner, Women Rising. Uh, we are working with the Hudson County Department of Housing and Community Reintegration on the year two program and expansion um, now that the uh, pandemic restrictions have eased. Uh, we also have a new student success coordinator. She's not in the room. Her name is uh, Fabiola Ocean, uh, who began this month, and she's being mentored by Maritza Reyes, who launched the program last year. I uh, want to give a huge thank you to all the colleagues who continue to support this program, including uh, Sheila, David Clark, Nakia, Matt, Kevin Ng, faculty, and many, many, many others. So thank you for that. Thank you, Lori. Um, I'm going to provide an update on our work with NJRC. Um, a few weeks ago, Friday, March 4th, um, a handful of our colleagues from admissions and financial aid went down to the Governor's Reentry Training and Employment Center in Kearney um, to assist NJRC clients, our future students, complete their HCCC application and the FAFSA. Um, and really provided just wonderful one-to-one -one support. So I'd like to thank Nikia Santos, Janine Nunez, Shamika Jennings, Akra Usmani, Maribel Bozoglu, Sheila Marie Atua Krum, Sylvia Mendoza, and Matthew Fessler. Um, thank you so much, really, for making that happen. I, I think it really benefited the students. They were so grateful for the, for the support and the one-on-one -on -one mentoring and help you provided that day. And it's certainly a model moving forward for how we want to, want to facilitate um, application completion, FAFSA completion, and really the student's introduction to, the, to their experience with HCCC. Um, so thank you very much. Otherwise, we've had, last week, we had five students begin in the hot food proficiency certificate. Um, we met the students when they arrived. Um, Dr. K greeted them, got them all set up with their chef's jackets and other, other 
paraphernalia they would need for the class. Thank you, Dr. Kay, for your continued partnership, and thank you to Chef Robert Bennett, who is teaching the section. Um, so they're with us two days a week through the rest of spring semester in one course, and then the idea is that they'll finish the balance of the courses in the hot food proficiency certificate uh, through the summer. So we're hoping they'll be done by the end of summer, too. Um, and again, thank you also to our counterparts at NJRC. Lori and I meet weekly with them, and this has really taken a village, but it was so rewarding to see the students in class and just so excited um, last week. And then my final update is that yesterday, Lalisa sent out a, a calendar invite to all full-time and part-time faculty about an upcoming workshop focused on um, providing guidance and mentor, mentorship for faculty who are either currently teaching in the Academic and Workforce Pathways program or working with the reentry students or who would like to in the future. Um, so that is happening on April 7th at 2 p.m. via WebEx. So look for that in your inbox. I'm sure it'll circulate again, but it did come out yesterday mid-afternoon. Um, and then Lori will provide an update on welding. So in addition to the Hot Foods Proficiency Certificate, uh, plans are underway to offer a welding class at NJRC, tentatively scheduled to begin in June. The course is the non-credit version of the recently approved welding class in the STEM division. Um, NJRC is building the welding lab for the class and has received a lot of interest from their clients for this. And they've also reached out to employers and have had interest uh, from employers in hiring individuals with this certification. So it's really coming together uh, very well. We have coordinated meetings with the Hudson County Jersey City One Stops and the Hudson County Jersey City Workforce Development Board to support to tuition for these students as it's being offered on the non-credit side. I also want to mention that we do have a new student success coordinator working with Heather and I, uh, Marion Bettencourt, who began this month. And she's being mentored by Al Williams, who is our advanced manufacturing student success coordinator and has been engaged in supporting the welding program from the beginning. So thank you. Thank you so much, Lori and Heather. This is truly transformational, life-changing work, and uh, it's great to see it moving forward and expanding. Really, really appreciate it, and we hope that this becomes a more and more significant part of how we deliver on our mission. Last Thursday, we held a signing ceremony in the STEM multi-purpose room to celebrate our new dual admissions and articulation agreement with New Jersey City University, University, NJCU, in the area of cybersecurity. We welcomed NJCU President Sue Henderson and many of her colleagues at the ceremony. Students benefiting from this agreement will have a seamless transfer experience and maintain maximum transferability of credits between our two institutions. They'll receive advisement from NJCU faculty while enrolled at Hudson County Community College. We uh, so sincerely thank Professor Faisal Al-Jamal and Dean Burl Yearwood for initiating the development of this agreement in an area of huge priority and interest nationwide. And I also want to do a shout out to Dr. Heather DeVries for her leadership in coordinating the agreement and its approval. Thank you, colleagues. You know, when, when Lalisa spoke, <clears throat> she, she mentioned that HCCC is a great college to work for, and I hope you all agree, and want to remind us all that uh, there's a survey currently underway that some of you have received from the National Great Colleges to Work For Network. This is a national competitive program. Uh, they survey members of college communities and, uh, and then ultimately award the distinction of great colleges to work for to those institutions who meet their standard. So if you've received a survey, I hope you'll fill it out, uh, especially if you feel this is a great college to work for. Uh, and I, Anna, when is the deadline to complete it? So uh, April 1st, please fill it out before April 1st, if you would. Our complex but exciting academic talent project continues to develop. There's not really uh, much of an update report today uh, for reasons that I'll ask Nicholas Chevrolati to share. Nicholas, are you here? Dr. Chevrolati? 
we spoke this morning, he was going to give an update. Well, let me let me give it. Uh, we are actually making tremendous progress on this project. Chris, uh, I'm yeah. Sorry. Oh, there he is. Go right ahead. He wouldn't let me unmute. Uh, okay. <laughs> the uh, uh, first of all, let me begin uh, thanking everyone for their input. Um, the tower project is the design of the building is coming to a close. We're hoping that in April we'll be in a position to speak to the board about uh, final uh, design and, and layout, as well as uh, the budget and the uh, associated with the project. We would also be following up and uh, with the ACC and others. I know I've reached out to a couple of uh, colleagues who had sent uh, very specific questions uh, to schedule follow-up meetings. But we are we are on schedule and we've made a lot of progress. Um, you know, in our ideal world, we've set a very, very ambitious goal of uh, getting authorization uh, this summer to prepare the bid packages and uh, move forward uh, with the project. Uh, associated with this, Chris, I'll just mention uh, we are finalizing our negotiations with the JCRA for the purchase of 162, 168, and 70 SIP Avenue. Uh, those are pretty far along. We are anticipating that we'll be able to close on those properties within the next uh, month or two, depending on uh, how many hiccups uh, we actually run into. And just to remind everyone, once we sell those properties, we will continue to occupy them uh, rent free. Uh, that, that calculation was part of the purchase uh, for three years or at least three years. And I just mentioned that just because I'm, I'm assuming once we close on the site, uh, there'll probably be a press statement uh, from the city. Very good. Thank you, Nicholas. It's a huge project to lead and it really is coming to fruition. We see it. Uh, we see it in the horizon on the horizon. Uh, so the sale of those facilities, which is public information to the Jersey city redevelopment agency will generate 16 million dollars that will be applied to the financial stack for the new tower. We're still working on that. So, uh, we don't yet have full funding for this building that we hope to break ground for within like by next year. Um, but we're getting there and this is a huge, uh, step forward. The value of this sale to us is actually greater than 16 million because of the ability to occupy the facilities for three years rent free. If we had to relocate and find temporary space, it would be enormously expensive. So nothing really changes for us other than to let you know that, um, we're really moving full speed ahead on, uh, the day we can celebrate breaking ground on this, uh, state of the art facility. So at our next meeting, Nicholas should be able to provide more information about the, um, the, the, the final details of the facility. Okay, so we now open the meeting to questions, comments, and topics of celebration. For those of you here in the Scott Ring Room and at the North Hudson campus and those on WebEx, please raise your hand if you'd like to speak.